Good morning. Dobra utro. Dobra utro. Srimad Bhagavatam, seventh canto. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go right into the Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 7, Chapter 15. Instructions for civilized human beings. If there's any left on the planet, we hope there is. <laughs> Maybe one or two. <laughs> Sorry about that. And uh, text number 38 and 39. Okay. Grihastasya kriyatagyo. Oh, you don't? Okay, you, you don't have? Okay, let's just, we'll do the word for word. Grihatasya. For a person situated in householder life. Kriyatagya. To give up the duty of a householder. Vratataga, to give up vow, vows and austerity. Vato, for a brahmachari. Api, also. Tapasvina, for a vanaprastha, who has adopted, who has adopted a life of austerities. Grama Seva, to live in a village and serve the people therein. Bikso, for a sannyasi who lived by begging alms. Indra, Indriya Lokata, addicted to sense enjoyment. Ashrama of the spiritual orders of life. Apasada, the most abominable. He, indeed, Ete, all these. Kalu, indeed. Ashrama Vidambana. Imitating and therefore cheating the different spiritual orders. Deva Maya Vimudan, who are bewildered by the external energy of the Supreme Lord. Tan, Tan, them, Upeksater. But, but one should reject and not accept as genuine. Anukampaya, or by compassion, teach them real life. Okay. Very long translation and very short purport. <clears throat> 
It is abominable for a person living in the Grihastha ashram to give up the regulative principles. For a brahmachari not to follow the vows of brahmachari while living under the care of the guru. For a vanaprasa to live in a village and engage in so-called social activities. And for a sannyasi to be addicted to sense gratification. One who acts in this way is to be considered the lowest renegade. Such a pretender is bewildered by the external energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and one should neither either reject him from any position, or taking compassion on him, teach him, if possible, to resume his original position. Hmm. It's very, did you get that per, uh, translation? It's up there. Okay, good. Purport. We have repeatedly stressed that human culture does not begin unless one takes to the principles of honor and ashram, and ashram dharma. Although grihastha life is a concession for the enjoyment of sex, one cannot enjoy sex without following the rules and regulations of household life. Furthermore, as already instructed, a brahmachari must live under the care of a guru. Brahmachari guru kule vasa danto guru hitam. If a brahmachari does not live under the care of the guru, if a vanaprastha engages in ordinary activities, or if a sannyasi is greedy and eats meat, eggs, and all kinds of nonsense for the satisfaction of his tongue, he is a cheater and should immediately be rejected as unimportant. Such persons should be shown compassion, and if one has sufficient strength, one should teach them to stop them from following the wrong path in life. Otherwise, one should reject them and pay them no attention. Omagyan timirandasya gyanajana salakaya chaksu unmilitam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha shri chaitanya mano bistam staptitam yena bhutale swayam rupa gadam mayam dadanti swam padantikam nama om vishnu padaya krishna prasthaya bhutale shri bhakti bhakti vedanta swami iti namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesa Sunyavari Pastyatya De Satarine Panchakopa Turubhisya Kripa Sindhu Bhayavaja Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Jaisi Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Srivasadi Gaur Bhaktarinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. It is abominable for a person living in Grihastha ashram to give up the regulative principles, for a brahmachari not to follow the brahmachari vows while living under the care of the guru, for a vanaprasa to live in the village and, not, and engage in so-called social activities, for a sannyasi to be addicted to sense gratification. One should try to teach them. If they are not teachable, one should reject them. That is the essence of this verse. So here's the, these are the four orders of life, the four spiritual orders of life, uh, different brahmacharis, uh, grihastha, vanapras, and sannyas. So this is called Varna and Ashram. The Varnas are Brahma, Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sudra. So civilized human society is considered to be civilized when they are following the Varnashram system. Otherwise, it's considered to be below civilization. In other words, it's an animal civilization. Simply to do what you want in the name of individual expression or freedom or position is uh, whimsical and destructive, both for the individual and for others. 
Therefore, human life, as opposed to any other forms of life, means restriction. The animals cannot be restricted. You can't try to, you can train an animal up to a certain point, but still he will follow his animal nature. But human beings, they cannot follow the animal type nature because we have two nature. We have a godly nature and we have an animal nature. Our animal nature is the bodily necessities of life, eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. So they're part of maintaining this body and they're required. But if these things are not restricted according to regulations given by the Shastras, then one is living outside of a human life. Why are these restrictions made and why is it given a system? Because by following Varnashram, because Varnashram is the beginning, it's not the goal. It's the foundation for living life in the proper way and eventually developing higher consciousness. When Lord Chaitanya went to speak with uh, Ramananda Roy, Ramananda Roy was asked by Lord Chaitanya what is the actual principle of spiritual life, the highest principle. And the first thing he said, Vanashrama Charyata, Purushe Parampara, Vishnu Arati Panta Nanuto Shansakaranam. He mentioned the Vanashram sister. Lord Chaitanya said, Iho Bahi. Ihubaha, which means that's external. It's external. So Vanashram is external, but it's required. <laughs> Otherwise, it's not, why is it emphasized in the Shastras? Because it's a human form of life. So Srila Prabhupada, when he first began the Krishna consciousness movement, was very enthusiastic to when he first began, he could see human society was so upside down. No one followed any types of rules and regulations. People ate when they wanted to eat, slept when they wanted to, had sex when they wanted to, whatever, whoever they wanted to, and had various types of defending. And no one was following their Barnas, Brahmins, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sudras. You had people leading the country who are Sudras. And you had Brahmins who were doing nothing. So you had everything upside down. So Prabhupada, he saw that this Vanashram system cannot be implicated, implemented in this, in this society. It's just not possible. It's too topsy-turvy, too problematic. They'll never be. So he decided that the main thing is we should spread the holy name everywhere and elevate people through the chanting of the holy name. Ultimately, unless one is following Vanashram Dharma, they can't really chant the holy name. <laughs> but Prabhupada saw Vanashram was impossible in this age. And so for the first seven years, or maybe even yeah, maybe eight years after he started. Up until the year 1974, Prabhupada began in 1966. So about eight years later, he kept rejecting the idea of establishing Varnashram. But then when he saw many of the dev devotees who were practicing Krishna consciousness, although they were chanting and uh, engaging in devotional service, they couldn't maintain their steadiness. They couldn't stay fixed in Krishna consciousness. And he saw a lot of them were going away and many of them were falling down also. And there was a lot of fall downs in the beginning of the movement. Prabhupada tried to save it in so many different ways. And he did to some degree, but he saw that there's something else needed besides the chanting of the holy name. And so in 1974, he started to say, now we have to establish this Vanarashram. It's a must in human society. Otherwise, why are so many devotees falling down? So in March 14th, 1974, in Vrindavan, he gave a more than one hour morning walk conversation on Vanarashram, discussion with his senior devotees. 
And then on March 16th, two days later, he again spoke about it. And then he started to emphasize the importance of establishing Vanarsham. But Prabhupada knew we couldn't establish it outside of our, uh, what we say, our society. So he wanted to create it within the society. He called it Daivi Vanarsham, or spiritual Vanarsham. And that was to engage people in devotional service and train them to become Brahmins, to become Kshatriyas. And some education for Vaishyas and Sudras don't really need training. And so Prabhupada started to emphasize that. And for those final four years, 74, 75, 76, and 77, he really pushed it. <clears throat> and then in 77, he really, he said, we have to, otherwise, we won't be able to maintain our uh, society if we don't establish this Van Ashram. And he saw, so devotees were working, and he said, the farm communities is where these Van Ashram systems need to be implicated in the farm implemented in the farm communities he said you can't do it in the cities he said our city temples are meant for preaching and the farms are meant for living he says the city he said another's name for city is hell <laughs> he said that he said that in public to reporters on television in london when they asked him, what is, what is, what is your, uh, what is it? What is your conception of hell? He said, London. <laughs> that was his response. The next day in the paper, front page headlines, Swamiji calls London hell, right on the front page of the London Tribune, which is the biggest paper in London. <laughs> Swamiji calls London hell. And then he said, you know, it's always it's a small little aisle and it's dark. It's always cold and rainy. <laughs> and then he went down to describe how India, the sun is shining all the time. <laughs> and so, but then Prabhupada understood that in general, Western cities couldn't be the place for implementing so he said that every temple should have a farm community connected with the temple. And it's a long discussion between Rameshwara and Tamal Krishna Goswami and Prabhupada. And Prabhupada's giving all the details. He said, our temples should be, every day we should invite people to come and we should cook prasadam. And he said, we should cook poris, halava, one sabji and chutney. And anyone comes, they should get these four preparations. He said, we should cook in the morning and have it ready for all day and serve it hot to the guests as they come. And then he said, if there's any left over from the day, after the end of the day, we can, the devotees can eat it. <laughs> but then he said that and we should get the ingredients for our cooking from our farms. Therefore, we have to establish our farms. He said, if we grow our own food and produce and have our own milk products, then the food will taste so nice. And when it's offered to Krishna, it's the perfect offering. And then people will come just for prasadam. And if they come just for prasadam, then they'll see the devotees, they'll hear the kirtan, they'll may even stay for the classes. So Prabhupada saw how powerful prasadam was, and he wanted that. And he said that these cities that we live in, they won't last. He said they'll crumble, they'll fall. The cities will become places of simply thieves, that's all. And, he's, and we're seeing how everything is collapsing now. Prabhupada predicted this. And he said, therefore, we have, if we establish our farm communities, we can live on our farms, and we will have everything we need to live nicely and practice Krishna consciousness. And then we can invite the population to come on the farms to live, 
and then we can train them in varna, not ashram, in varna, how to become a brahmachari, how to become a, uh, I mean, how to become a, a brahman, how to become vaisha, uh, kshatriya, like that. And he said that way, after we train them in, in varna, then we can introduce the ashram second. And people will come because the cities will collapse. He said the farms are generally for the, for the grihastas. All the grihastas should live on the farms and take care of the farms. The sannyasis should travel and preach and the brahmacharis should keep us preaching center in the cities and preach there and then invite people to come to our farms. Prabhupada made a whole program to outline how the society should go on. So we're not really developing these farm communities. We don't see the benefit of it. But soon it'll come where we either have to take to these farm communities or we'll have to starve because these, these cities will collapse. They're already collapsing. Most of the governments right around now are broke. They're broke. They don't have money. The, uh, this, the last year has put governments around the world in great debt. And so now what they're going to do is tax you until you can't have, until you have no money left. <laughs> People will be giving their whole paycheck to the governments now. I have one personal example that happened in Croatia where one government agency sent people out to find mistakes in people who are small business people. I won't give the names of that. But this person was told, you go to these small businesses and find some, something they're doing wrong and give them a fine. <laughs> because we need money. And the person who was going to do it, she didn't want to do it. But they said, if you don't do it, then you don't have a job. <laughs> we'll get somebody else. And so she did it. And later on, she told our devotees what she was told to do. <laughs> How the governments are broke. That's including Slovenia. They're all, all of the governments are in such big debts now around the world because of the coronavirus. And so now... They're going to try to get as much money as they can in so many different ways to make it up taxes, tariffs, so many different things. So this is, we're starting to see how society is starting to crumble. And it will. It's Prabhupada said this whole society, especially the cities, will crumble. So we have to establish these farm communities. Otherwise, we will be nowhere. We won't be able to maintain ourselves, nor will we be able to preach Krishna consciousness effectively. So as well, while this, we should keep all our city temples, but also develop our farms and put energy, time, resources, money into these farms and develop them. And in this area of the world, Croatia and Slovenia, there are many devotees who have farms. There are many, not just a few devotees, but there are many. I know at least four off the top of my head is in, in, in Slovenia itself, I know three. In Croatia, I know three. I know six devotees who have farms. But they're basically all alone doing their own thing, you know, trying to maintain their farms. If we could develop these farm communities, <clears throat> as Prabhupada gave the guideline, develop agriculture, keep cows, um, produce you know, grains, produce vegetables, we will have everything and we can also use it for, for using it for trade to get other products that we need if we have excess. Prabhupada's whole outline, he outlined the whole program for the Vanashram system. So, um, yeah. So this Vanashram system, Daivi Vanashram, is really, as Prabhupada said, when someone asked... <clears throat> Prabhupada, when Prabhupada was leaving the world, Prabhupada said, 50% of my mission is unfinished. And Prabhupada, the devotee said, do you mean you didn't com com complete Srimad Bhagavatam purports? Prabhupada said, no. 
It was the Van Ashram. I haven't established the Daibi Van Ashram. So he wanted us to do it because <laughs> he knew that the society will fall, a little collapse. And if it doesn't collapse by disease, it'll collapse by war or economic uh, problems this way and that way. And they're, they're raping the earth, trying to get more resources from the earth. And so it's, the, the world is in a very difficult situation right now. And so it's going, and if they continue in the same way, it'll become only worse. And they don't really have any recourse. So what, what we need to do as a society, we need to preach as much as we can, keep the Sankirtan movement going, have devotees go out as much as can we can, preach, distribute books. Prabhupada said, we have two solid programs in our movement. Solid means when you put energy into it, you get big results. And he said those two things are farm communities and book distribution. He said these are the two things that will move our society forward. Distributing my books and he said establishing these farm communities. So Prabhupada, Prabhupada was a visionary. He wasn't just, just a great, what we say, spiritual person. He had a vision. He could see, because he was in touch with Krishna. Krishna was telling him exactly how to expand this movement accordingly. So we need to do that. That's our next stage, to establish these farm communities and train devotees in the different ashrams and varnas, how to become an ideal brahmachari, how to, how to become an ideal grihastha, how to become ideal in vanaprast and sannyas. The Bra he said the brahmins should be the teachers and they can train everybody else. They can train others to be, to, to be kshatriyas. He said we need kshatriyas to defend our society when people come. If people attack or cause trouble, there should be a class of devotees who are fighters. He spoke that many times, even wrote about it. That can defend our society because as the city is, the cities get worse, people... Fortunately, in your country, there's not so much crime. People are somewhat very civilized here. People are more cultured here, but around the world, you know, you find like, cities are hell. I mean, literally hell. And I have a one disciple, he drives a car, <clears throat> and he drives Uber. He's an Uber driver, you know what Uber is, right? You hire him. So he was driving somebody in one place in Chicago, and he comes across Two guys are fighting in the street and they're wrestling and another guy has a gun and he's shooting the gun over the head of the other two guys while they're fighting. <laughs> he, was, he, just told, he just wrote me a letter just two days ago. He said, this is what I saw, Maharaj. <laughs> I said, well. So this, I mean, this, is, this goes on in a lot of cities around the world. Some, some cities are so bad that the police don't even go there because the, the population has automatic rifles, machine guns, and various types of weapons. So if there's any crime, the people have to settle it themselves. They can't call the police because the police won't come. <laughs> They're afraid, actually. I mean, this is, this is the cities in America that's like that. And many other cities around the world also are just places of, you know, sense gratification and crime, a lot of crime, drugs, Drugs are coming into here now after so many years. That was the benefit of communism. Communism kept a lot of the influence of the West away. And because of that, this area of the world was free from a lot of the sinful activities and cheating and lying and thievery that was going on in the so-called free world. The communist regime was strict. But it, it kept out crime, it kept out a lot of, of the wrong activities. But now since communism is no longer there, everything is coming in, you see what's happening to India. India is turning into a, a place of so much problems now, 
so much crime, so much sense gratification, it's becoming quite crazy there now. It's even worse than some Western countries. So, uh, therefore, Prabhupada could foresee that the society is not going to last. It's, and people are just going to become crazy after a while. And when pre people become desperate, then crime becomes automatic. Just to live, people will commit crime. So I don't think it'll happen so soon here, because this area of the world is a little bit better than most areas of the world. At least, at least the population, the governments are corrupt, we know that. <laughs> the governments are, they're all cheaters. They're always just trying to get your money, that's all. Because <laughs> they want bigger salaries, that's all. And that's, the, that's Kali Yuga governments. So, therefore, Prabhupada said, we've got to establish these farm communities. Otherwise, our, our movement will be checked we won't be able to go on. <clears throat> so it's a need of the time to see and to look towards that. And there are some leaders who are doing it. Hungary's doing it. Places in America are starting to do it. Uh, places in the UK are also starting to do it. There is a few successful farms starting to develop according to Prabhupada's vision. So it's happening. Slowly, 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 but it's too slow. The rest of the society is not doing it, either because of lack of manpower or, or not seeing the importance. And establishing farm communities is not so easy. You have to have people willing to live in that lifestyle. And I find most devotees are coming from the cities, and therefore they have a little bit of a what we say, difficult time adjusting to that lifestyle living on the farms. I lived in New Vrindavan for 20 years. It was one of the first farm communities in ISKCON. Started back in 1968. I was there from 1973 to 1993, 20 years. I went out a little bit for preaching a few times, but mostly I was there at the community. And for me to live on the farm was extremely, extremely difficult because I grew up in the cities. <laughs> I never knew what a farm was like, you know, so. And uh, so when, after a while I started to go out preaching and then I found that that was more natural for me than to live on the farms. But I did it for 20 years. <laughs> and I learned a lot. I learned the benefits of that kind of lifestyle, and it was many benefits. But Prabhupada said, this, the grihastas, those who are married, should, they can raise children, we can start a school on the, in these communities, we can have gurukuls, and various types. Now the uh, communist rules are dropping. People can homeschool their children, even now in these areas, before, up to about five years ago, it wasn't like that. Now it's changing. So when you send kids to schools, public schools, what do they learn? They don't learn anything beneficial. They just learn more about how to enjoy sense gratification a little better. So this is the this is our future, this Van Ashram, Jai Shishi Panchatadva Ki Jai. And it's the way Krishna lived. Krishna was a cowherd boy. <laughs> so we're not doing something new, we're simply following the tradition like that. So this is uh and then of course Prabhupada the, the main point of this verse is to help people understand that their role as a brahmachari, grihastha, vanaprasa, sannyas has rules and regulations and then one should follow those carefully and strictly. Generally the grihasthas have a hard time following the four regulative principles, even in our society. I find that it's very difficult for those who are married to keep those four regulative principles there have been even petitions by Grihastas to relax some of those principles, and you know which one I'm talking about. And, but uh, 
Prabhupada was strong not to change those rules because he knew this is the foundation by which our society develops based on these four rules, four restrictions like that. So he was very strict. <clears throat> so each one of the ashrams here has a set of rules and right. For brahmacharis, brahmacharis should be clean. They should know the shastras. They should be able to speak and give classes. All brahmacharis should be able to give classes. They should be able to do whatever services are required in the temple. Grihastas should be, should maintain themselves nicely, honestly, and uh, worship the deity. If they don't worship it in the temple, they should establish deity worship in their home. And they should give in charity. For Banaprastas, well, it's not so clear in our society yet what is the activities of Vanaprast because Vanaprast simply means living in the forest. But it's not so practical in this age. And for sannyasis, they're meant to travel and preach, <laughs> not to stay in one place it's too long. Hmm. Otherwise, they get strange. You, <laughs> you can tell by my classes, you know, after, I, after staying in one place too long, you get kind of strange. <laughs> so that's, sannyasis have to keep moving. <laughs> Like that. And Prabhupada said once something is established, they can stay in one place for some time, four months at a time, but no longer. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's, these are the rules and regulations. And then in the 12th canto, in the third chapter, at the very end of the third chapter, it describes that in Kali Yuga, the effects of Kali Yuga will make, uh, will cause each of these ashrams to have one bad quality. Brahmacharis will be unclean, not clean. Grihastas will fail to give in charity. Vanaprastas will fail to go to the forest. <laughs> And sannyasis will keep money, keep wealth. <laughs> so in, in that, this is in the 12th canto of Bhagavatam. So you'll see that, yeah. When Prabhupada was here, he went into one brahmachari ashram and he was just walking around looking at the ashram, inspecting it. Came to one ashram, brahmachari, he looked in and he said, brahmachari means dirty. <laughs> Yeah, he, he didn't mean that. He was just being sarcastic. The, the brahmacharis are not clean in this age because we keep too much stuff. That's why we have stuff piled up all over the place and you can't keep it clean. Keep it simple and just keep what you need. For grihastas, they're supposed to give a, a regularity, a percentage of their income to help propagate religious principles. In other words, they should give to the temple and to and establish projects, Krishna conscious projects. And Prabhupada said to the Grihastas, if you need any money, go see the sannyasis. Because <laughs> he knew the sannyasis have all the money. <laughs> and hasn't changed either <laughs> since Prabhupada left. <laughs> And there are a few sannyasis I know that don't touch money. Whatever money they get, they give it to their mm, supporting disciples or programs. They immediately put it into programs. They never keep any personal money. If they need money for travel, they just request it. There are a few sannyasis like that. I won't name I won't make any names. But generally it's not like that. So this age is Kali Yuga, Manda Sumanda Matayo Manya Padrataha. And we're trying to adjust to work, to fit into this this uh, Western society, which is really quite difficult to live in. 
Okay, so these are some points on Ban Ashram and then on the different ashrams itself. Any comments or questions? There is one question in the, over the internet. Uh, says, uh, I know some uh, brahmacharis who live at home have no desire to marry. What do you think about them? Some criticize those brahmacharis. Well, Prabhupada also made statements. He said, don't become bachelor daddy. Bachelor daddy. <laughs> that means no wife. Because home mean, means wife. Grihasta means living in a home with a wife. Not just living in a home, but living in a home with a wife. That's Grihasta. And Brahmachari means working under the guise of the temple authorities. So an independent Brahmachari is not, a, not really following the principles of Brahmachari. He's just a single, single student. That's all you can really say. He's a student who's single, that's all, and doesn't have any connection with the ashrams in the real sense, because each of the ashrams have their rules. <laughs> and the reasons why brahmacharis live under the guise of this, the temple is to protect them from the outside influences, because it's very difficult to control your senses if you're living in the environment of the materialistic society. You'll be attracted to, attracted or diverted away from that. And there's women out there. So brahmachari means association with other brahmacharis living in the ashram like that. That's brahmachari. And if one wants to get married, they can leave that ashram and then develop uh, a place to live outside and become a nice grihasta like that. But generally, to live outside and be not married doesn't fit into the definition of brahmachari. It's just single student, that's all. And this is not my opinion, it's Srila Prabhupada's words. I'm simply giving you his understanding. So, yeah, the best thing to do is either move into the temple, or if you can't, maybe start a little ashram yourself outside. Get a few people who are like that, like yourself, and have a little ashram living where three or four men live together in one little apartment, and then they can practice Krishna consciousness there and create an environment of spirituality there in the apartment. But living alone? No. Or living with parents? It's not... No. Mm -hmm. Like that. Any any follow up question? No, that's just okay. Anything else? We have uh, Uddhava Mitra Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you very much for lecture. Uh, I I don't remember. Um, it, I mean, somehow, like you said, mentioned that Grihastha's obligation they are free, like uh, taking care nicely from themselves, giving out charity, and what was the third one? For the activities of Grihastha? Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. uh, worshipping the deity. Yeah. If you go to the fifth canto, you'll find that Prabhupada writes that Grihastas, if they don't regularly worship the deity, 
their falling down in Krishna consciousness is guaranteed. Guaranteed. That's the exact words. So either they have to worship the deity at the temple or they have to do it at home, either one. So it's, it's mandatory for grihasas to do deity worship. Thank you. If they come to the temple and participate in temple activities, that's fine. But they have to have they have to center around their their activities centered around the deity, either the deity in the temple or the deity at home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's necessary in Kali Yuga. Mm -hmm. Kali Yuga is so full of distractions, and the deity helps to purify the conscious, helps to develop regulation, helps to develop good qualities in the mode of goodness. All these things come from deity, worshiping the deity. <laughs> okay, who's that? Uh, Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. So you see, when you look at our society, we have a long way to go. <laughs> but the farm communities are where we should now be putting our emphasis on Sankirtan, book distribution, farm communities, like that. Deity worship's important, but not the main thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else? Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.